Okay. So, okay, friends, it's uh, eight thirty in Indian Standard Time, and we are here for the mega webinar series named as the Saturday Manufacturing Talks. As you might be aware that this uh, webinar series we are uh, we have started uh, the conducting since March twenty twenty one, and today is the forty ninth week, and uh, we are planning to take this uh, webinar series uh, till the completion of one year. And uh, in this particular platform, uh, we are conducting uh, the uh, the seminar series by the eminent speakers, both from academic world and also from the industrial uh, the domain. So the speakers have discussed or shared their views on different aspects of manufacturing, starting from the additive manufacturing process, industry 4.0, welding process, modeling and simulation, optimization, so and so. So our uh, the the scholars over here uh, and also the the scholars uh, across the globe, I would say, are getting immensely benefited by the by you know the uh, attending this webinar series. Post series post webinar, they are discussing with the concerned faculty member or the industry, getting know how to take this research you know the forward. So that's that you know that was one of the the major uh, the. Uh, the aspects of the, before I mean, while conducting this webinar series. Now, today we are, uh, you know, very much fortunate to have Dr. Parth Sarathi Mandal with us. Dr. Mandal is uh, associated with uh, our, you know, the research lab long back. It was, I think since uh, 2008, we had, uh, you know, the co-supervised uh, MTech students, uh, uh, Nilanjan Dasakladar, who is now a faculty of our department, and Nilanjan uh, later on did PhD under Dr. Parsarthi Mandal from the University of Manchester. Dr. Mandal is currently a reader in bio bioengineering and structural mechanics at the University of Manchester in UK. He was the director of civil engineering undergraduate programs from 2012 to 2017. He also leads the bioengineering research theme in the School of Mechanical Aerospace Civil Engineering Department. He is the head of equality, diversity, inclusion, and access for the School of Engineering. He obtained his first degrees in engineering from India in IIT Durgapur. He was the topper uh, in his batch and MTech from IIT Kanpur. He was the 10 pointer uh, at that time, followed by a PhD from University of Cambridge under a very renowned researcher. In the field of structural mechanics. After his PhD, he joined the University of Manchester. Then it was called as the UMIST, first as a research associate on a EPSRC sponsored project. And after a very short period, eight months' time, he became the, uh, the lecturer at UMIST and subsequently promoted to the current position of the reader at the University of Manchester in UK. He has a long standing strong expertise in analytical, computational, and experimental aspects of structural mechanics. However, his current research topics go beyond the narrow confinement of conventional structural mechanics. So, he is also working on the large scale structures to micromechanics of human cells. As I mentioned, that he is also associated with the bioengineering. He is currently one of the co-directors of Manchester Institute of Collaborative Research and on Aging, MICRA, and an academic advisor of the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission. He is an associate editor of research on biomedical engineering, Springer Nature Journal. Dr. Mondol is also co-supervising one of our doctoral scholars. I think uh, he is also present today, uh, Parvej uh, Iqbal. And uh, apart from that, on personal front, we are very close friend uh, since our days at IIT Kanpur. With this, uh, you know, the very brief introduction about uh, Dr. Mandal, I request him to uh, deliver his, uh, you know, the lecture. And I am pretty sure that all of you present over here will immensely enjoy his talk. Dr. Mandal. Thank you, Professor Paul. Thank you for your kind introduction. If I can share my screen. Yeah. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. yeah that's, that's the idea. Okay. So thank you for your kind introduction. 
and as you said that we know each other nearly 30 years now and with and then later on kept the connections so thanks for the invitations for giving this opportunity and the title was given by professor paul as process modeling and its importance in manufacturing now as he mentioned and and this is my brief bio i'm i'm not a manufacturing person in that sense but have been collaborating with professor paul for a long time on on various projects so going to speak about process modeling and its importance in manufacturing it's almost like that school child preparation for an essay for example if you, i don't know whether you know the story uh, a kid prepared a story on burning pyre ghat for example called in bengali it's called sasan ghat and the essay that came in the exam paper was on cow so talk about cows so poor kid what do you do he says two words or two sentences about cows and then kills it and takes it to the burning pyre and then he can talk about the burning pyre so unfortunately my talk is going to be like that in that way so i'll, I'll talk a little bit about the modeling and then bring you into my research area that i have been involved with but in all of those talk there would be element of modeling and that i'll highlight and i'll highlight how it is connected with the related field and especially with the manufacturing bent on it okay so just don't get disappointed if you don't get what you had intended this talk to be so what is modeling i'll start with that question what is modeling now the definition that comes from sort of book type of references is that it is selecting an appropriate set of equations i mean mathematical equations here to simulate the behavior of a physical system or a process and then solve the equation using numerical techniques now modeling is not fine just finite element model method finite element method is one type of numerical model so there are all sorts of various types of model that are there now there are main three elements in a model first you have got the formulations so you have to identify the process that you would like to model and within that then you have to select the appropriate mathematical equations that will ident that will represent that process and then you choose numerical technique to solve those equations then the next block from the formulation in in modeling is the evaluations so the evaluation typically comes through verification so verification is you check whether the equation that you have selected it is giving correct sort of results now the way to verify it often means to take an idealized problem for which let's say an analytical solution exists so if you, if you are doing a complicated problem simplify it to the extent that it, it there is an analytical solution possible and that exists there and then you compare your numerical results with that uh, analytical results that is one type of way of verifying so verifying whether your numerical technique is working all right now related to that is validation which is coming one step down now validation is slightly difficult validation means where you look at whether the model is actually representing the physical system or the process now you do that by comparing with some experimental data or by looking at an independent way of getting the data or the output for that process or the system 
and you need to do that also you need to sometimes calibrate a model now calibrating a model may, uh, is often related with uh, the input parameter calibration for example if you have created a model that will typically have a number of parameters or input there so you calibrate them you change it because often those parameters are not known or, or cannot be known when you started the model for example it requires some experiment for which you don't have the data but you know that it could be a range between such and such space for example such and such values so calibration is picking up those model parameters to have set of values on which your your output is closer to the process output from the experiment or other set of measurements now that's intrinsically so then you have got a calibrated model and then you validate your output from your calibrated model with the experiment and then you also do a sensitivity analysis how sensitivity analysis is related to the first one more rather the verification so you try to see whether the output that you are getting whether that is sensitive to the discretization that you have done or the input output boundary conditions that you have done for you have assumed for example so these are all part of the verifications as well as the sensitivity analysis and of course you have to be aware of the uncertainty of the results or the output that you are getting so without that uncertainty estimate your results or, or your results could be misleading in 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 many cases now the way the validations works is you have got a set of let's say experimental data and then you you use some amount of data to validate your output and then you evaluate that to check whether that is working absolutely fine or not so you cannot use the same set of data to do the both and of course when you have got a validated calibrated verified calibrated and validated model then you apply to do further analysis and then you can go to the predictions and ultimately use it in your design so for the students who are here in this talk i think that is very important point in here two points in here i could say that there is uh, these verifications and and the validations involving uncertainty and the, and the calibrated model and the model could be anything involving or solving a set of equations using numerical techniques now models could be various types it could be probabilistic so where the input parameter could be a set of values but in the process of the equation itself there is an element of probability in is incorporated so that the output you get would not be the same for the same set of input because the equation contains some amount of probability in there estimated in there then you get the output different whereas the deterministic is for a set of input you will get a unique set of output now currently if there is a bit of a hybrid system for example i could i probably mention if there is a time there uh, on earthquake ground motions that what I'm studying with one of the students, something called neo-deterministic, where you have got the input parameter may be uh, the, the same set, but you put some amount of variation in the input set using some amount of probabilistic estimate so that you get the results that are, that are not unique in that sense. Then the model could be linear in, in a way that you have got a system for which if you know for one set of input the output then you can easily scale up or scale down each of the output accordingly so without doing any further analysis so only one set of analysis would be enough for a strictly speaking linear system but in reality no process is linear it's only the window that you are looking at maybe you can assume that it is linear all processes are intrinsically physical processes are nonlinear and nonlinearity come from various sources the material behavior could be nonlinear your load could be 
nonlinear and and your other parameters for example the boundary could affect be different or at a different time space it could be different behavior so nonlinearity is one of the challenging area in terms of the modeling now the model also you could have a distributed system in which you consider your material and and other spatial quantities are distributed as they are in reality in the physical process but also opposed to that you could have a lumped system you could say okay all my material mass i could consider in the center of gravity of this part of the uh, this part of the body and that often results in reducing the complexity of the work and then the final classification i would say is a physical versus black box now what i mean the physical is when you can model using the equations that would represent the physical or the mechanistic background in this context of a problem and then you can uniquely find output for a set of input whereas in a black box system uh, we don't need to worry about detailed calculation that way so one example of a black box could be a statistical system for example artificial neural network so you, you put in a set of input with some variable and you get the output but you really don't bother you really don't know what is going on inside in terms of how it is combining those each each parameters to give you the output so ann is a typical example of a black box type that i'm talking about now all of these would depend on the scale and the scale i mean the space as well as the time at which time frame you are doing time scale you'll be doing and and what scale you'll be doing and often the problem is complicated as well because the scale of the model and the time frame of the model may not match with the physical system in terms of the space and the time and that's where the added complexity comes in so in terms of what i i i, I was putting forward in the last sentence was you have got the process and system and the model say both generate could generate the data given the system of input so you measure the data in the physical system and you generate the data for a set of input in in a model now of course the model has got lots of assumptions involved as i have said before about the physical process and in terms of the space and time often if they're equal space it, for example a parametric space for young's modulus now the, you know that you have measured it and you are using the similar sort of values in your model so i'll say they are of the same space in that sense so it is less uncertain and most of the PhD thesis probably stays in that way. So you have done some measurement within some parametric space. You have done now doing the modeling and they have the parametric process at the center. The second category is your system generates the data which are huge in that way or you have a lot of measurement. But in terms of the modeling, it's fairly rudimentary. In a way, you don't know what type of equations would characterize that process uniquely or, or, or what is the most appropriate set of equations. So I'll give you some examples on that, this type uh, later on. So, so, the, so we don't know the underlying physics that well. So then the modeling would be, would be limited in that sense. On the opposite side, it may be the experimental data or the data gathering of the physical systems may be limited. And the, all, although the model that we think will work is, is can span that one very well. And this space often relates with when we jump the scale, spatial scale primarily. So, so to give an example on, on, on the first system, if I go into the example now, so on the first one is uh, when they're fairly matching is I'm going to pick up the example that is uh, the problems that is done by Parvez Iqbal. He's probably there in the background uh, listening to it. So what he's investigating is a thermomechanical model met and metallurgical model of friction start welding. 
process. So his work, he has got, he's, he's putting his uh, uh, focus on pipes and how do you, how do you connect to segments of pipes and along, along a circumferential lines. So what he does is he does the experiments, he takes two bits of pipes and goes to the lab, fuse them using, using the machines in Professor Paul's lab and then measures various parameters. So he measures the torque uh, value, he measures the speed of the spindle and all the other physical properties, dimensions he measures, material properties he measures. And also then he takes, when finally it is all done, he takes and for a sample and can do a metallurgical analysis in the territory. So he collects all the data. But he also likes to do some amount of experiment in that, a, a numerical model to develop that. Why? The model also deepens the understanding of the process itself. And B, also what he's probably, if his examiner asks, he will say that we can only do experiment for only certain number of specimen because of the resource issues. So the resources is, is absolutely another key criteria to adopt modeling. But it's the first bit which is more important because often uh, the process, underlying process in terms of the physical behavior, unless we can find out an appropriate equations or some other means to describe the process from a mechanics point of view, then the understanding of the process is limited to some extent. So even if you have got the infinite resources and you could do experiment, still there is a space for model to understand the process very well. And that's what he's doing. So he's going on to detail about the temperature distribution. And then also model gives you the opportunity to take it beyond what he has studied. So he's studying an aluminum alloy in this case, that's the material and two pieces of pipes. Now, can he give the answer from his experiment that slightly broader questions that we are using friction start welding in this case, but can you give me an answer that what material property or what are the materials that can, that would be amenable to friction start welding? Can I join two pieces of copper? Can I join two pieces of plastic? Can I join two pieces of ceramic, for example? So what are the property limitations in there? that behavior often comes, that insight comes from coupled with modeling. So modeling takes it to the abstract level in many cases. But having said that, experiment is still the king in, in all, all branches of science and engineering. So you don't ex expect any model to um, uh, dictate life without having properly an experiment to, to verify that. Even going to the moon possibly. So some amount of experiment is necessary all the time. So as you're saying that he was doing the, uh, all the, doing the studies using FE, FEM in this case, to look at the temperature variation as well, the process of, uh, uh, and, and how that the spindle speed, for example, affects the microstructure evolution. So all these are within that space that I said before in the top one. So we have got the data collection, we have got the model, but then the model can, can lead into bigger questions in that sense. So he's not going at this stage in the, beyond the boundary, but there is a scope to, in, in, to, to extend the modeling and, and the understanding the modeling much better so that we can answer the questions. What are the, what are the sort of a bottleneck in terms of the material properties? that stops bricks and star welding to be used? Or what are the characteristics in a material that is absolutely essential to apply bricks and star welding? So, so that, that is the process probably which he will investigate in the future in, the, in this way. Okay, so in terms of, I talked about the, the second and third category and I said the temporal and and, and the time scale is important. For example, this is a multi-fidelity simulation design. So you, you can think about uh, human body. So I'm going into bioengineering now. So let's say you have got a cardiovascular system and you have got a branches of, of arteries and, and veins. So I want to simulate the, the blood flow through them. So sort of branches called, uh, of studies called hemodynamics. So the flow of blood, for example. 
So you could have a 1D representation of these arteries. It's fast. It, it can calculate the bulk parameters. Model can be tuned to case, for example. But precision is limited because you are just doing one dimensional analysis and also limited applicability. For example, we cannot design a stent uh, on, on based on 1D analysis. So if you move into 2D representation, that can identify local flow features, for example. So in 1D, you don't see any variations at a particular cross section, but in 2D, you can see the variation in at a particular cross section. So you have got a higher physical realism in this case. So what problem is it order of magnitude slower and you need bit of user expertise higher than do a 1D model in that case. Now, if that's not right, you go into 3D, have a complete system in this case with most faithful simulation, capable of high accuracy, but most expensive by far and also require higher user expertise than even the 2D. And then of course, you, you need to do the calibrations in the going backward as well from 3D to 2D and 1D, because many cases that the data that you'll gather would be based on a 1D representation or 2D representation, because the data you gather often does not match in terms of the dimensional scale. So you can measuring a velocity uh, at a certain point on, on the artery, and that could be at a particular cross section. So you don't measure often the velocity profile across the diameter of the, of the, of the artery, for example. So it's a 1D data gathering in that way. So how do you calibrate that with a 3D, 3D uh, model simulations in this case? So in terms of you could have a multi-scale process in these cases from just purely from uh, the way we see the physical system and the process and record data and the way we develop the model, it could be purely a multi-scale as well. And there could be a spatial scale and as well as a temp temporal scale. Now, in terms of the biomechanics, each, each branch is, it is in engineering is different. So we often have uh, with a sort of a high, often they come into groups in the corner. So you have got a spatial scale very high big system, but temporal scale is, is, is high in that case. But in the, in the, on the opposite side, you could have a spatial scale small and the temporal scale smaller. So how do you bridge the gap between those? For example, you want to form, see the AD formulations or in, in, in the blood flow at a certain location. So you are narrowing down in terms of the scale or, or, or the scope of this um, problem in that sense. And then you are putting the multi in the time scale also in, in, in smaller in that case. I'll, 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 I'll elaborate this scaling point, especially the spatial scale, scale with another problem, which was done by, uh, at the beginning I was talking about Nilanjan. So he, he did PhD on this multi-scale approach on, uh, on carbon fiber and bundle of carbon fibers. Now, many cases, uh, of using carbon fiber composites, uh, the process actually starts with the dry fiber mechanics. So you have got the carbon two of 20,000 fi individual fibers or 12,000 individual fibers, and they are dry fibers. And then they are in many cases, so woven carbon fiber composites, they're woven, they're weaved one, walked uh, and, and the one waved going across to each other in a different format. And then they're infused with resin to form the ultimate composites in that way. So the resulting product that you get, mechanical behavior often dictated by the dry fiber mechanics that at, at, the, at the processing, at the start of the processing. So how, a bundle of fiber, 20,000 individual fibers, how do they compact under the under under another set of toe above it and the bottom uh, behind it? And how much gaps that it generates? Because those are the voids that is through the raising would infuse and that will produce 
may produce void, may not produce void, and the, how come the thickness of the composites will all depend on this process of the dry fiber mechanics. Now, when we started this, process, this project, we are amazed to see that there is little even done on, on this side of the work, especially even a simple question of the, if you have got two carbon fibers, two, just you take two carbon fibers, the frictions between two carbon fibers. So even if, when you've got the 20,000 carbon individual filament together, the interactions between them are highly dominated by, of course, one thing is the pressure that you put it in from the other fibers, but within that group, also the frictions between them at the dry fiber stage plays an important role, how they're going to be deformed, how they're going to be behaved in that way, how they'll be compacted, this group of 20,000, and how this compaction would affect another set of fibers, which is running perpendicular to them. So, the first point was what is the uh, we know about friction is in terms of the coefficient of friction and standard things like Coulomb's law that friction force is proportional to the pressure that is pressure force that is a normal pressure force applied to the surface and then the proportional coefficient is constant is friction coefficient so f equal to mu times n but actual mechanics of friction is highly complicated and when we had when Elangen was doing the work then we had to take it to the the micro level to to isolate one fiber and using SEM to try out and see finding out what actually causes the the frictions within this fiber because the way the standard methodology standard mechanics is involved is that you have got undulations on the surface of, of any bodies and then when the suppressors so the stress concentration that flattens it and that's why you get the static friction versus kinematic kinetic friction differences between those. And then at some point, those would sit onto one another in the groups sort of way. And then with sufficient pressure, that would sort of a sort of, I wouldn't use the plasticity, but similar type of phenomena happens and then it slides in that way. So is that the case with the carbon fiber? So we tried to measure those in different ways. And, and Nilanjan was, to some extent successful in coming up with a numerical framework on how to define or do the carbon to carbon fiber to fiber friction and how does those frictions bulk friction coefficient changes when you change the number of fibers for example and how whole thing will be affected by 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 the frictions between them and under the pressures, for example, or if you're compacting them. So so typically one of these things that is shown a section of a carbon weave, and you could see that under pressure it forms like an elliptical uh, cross section on the wave. So we, we tried to model that and imagine doing that on a, for a 20,000 fiber is absolutely no go. So 20,000 fibers, 3D modeling is absolute. So, Again, we went for a multi-scale approach. So we'll start with few filaments, and then each filament is here, is, 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 is representing one carbon fiber, and they're attached with the next one with a combination of which you cannot see, there are some invisible interaction forces going through them. And those interaction forces are primarily uh, the, the frictions as well, both in the transverse as well as the longitudinal direction because we are doing it in a 2D framework, but we have taken a slice, but we have added something, uh, sort of an interaction, which will take into account the effect of the length. So, so what he was doing is what happens if you put them into the pressure and how do they do the deform in that way to going into that shape. So he would start with, again, the process that I said in the beginning, probabilistic versus deterministic. So here he will put into some amount of probability into the interaction so that the same geometry would give rise to different form of ultimate ultimate um, uh, cross-sectional behavior. So that's probability in the interactions, little amount there. Now, of course, this then was, in this case, was validated this model was validated with the bulk property so we had uh, we had a system on which we did some experiment 
with a toe and then we put some um, compressive force outside it perpendicular to it and see the how it flattens for example so how the friction is coming into picture into between them and then this model parameter in the statistical sense what i called calibrations that was taken place until you got a validated model but coming back to the scale issue how do you do it a model with a 20000 for a single toe and not just a single toe you are talking about multiple of those toes and going into warp and weft in the previous examples here how do you do that now of course then we went for the multi scale approach so we did that 2D multi scale, then 2D fiber assembly, 3D fiber assembly, and then we, we matched with one case. And then what you have got, we build on to those. So you've got a 2D with few elements, and then you take the bulk behavior, feed into the next level, and feed into the next level, et cetera, et cetera. So the process parameter, interaction parameter will change into each of these steps. So ultimately, for example, a 2D multi scale which could be solved at 10 minutes, for example, with a, that time for course, uh, I am sure uh, the process, it was, I'm talking about eight to 10 years back, the computational power was fairly low than, uh, than, than now. So it was about eight years back. And then this is the 3D fiber assembly. So computational cost using this multi-scale approach can be, can be tackled in that sense. Okay, so we took that approach to uh, to do a, a similar analysis on an airbag that you have. Airbag is a very sophisticated structure in a sense. It, it saves life, but also the way it fires up. So when, when the vehicle impact happens, so airbags may pop out. Now, when it pops out, the chemicals inside the bag releases gas and then the then it starts to um, blow up like a balloon for example but it doesn't happen like it makes a balloon which is which is which is hard or which is stiff then hitting on to that airbag could cause death itself so there are little gaps they introduce in there so it is a sort of a two fabrics two pieces of circular chamber and then those gaps there they open up and that that maintains the pressure so when impact happens with head or, or other parts of the human body then it's a sort of a soft landing rather than, rather than it's a it's not a sort of a balloon filled with air so there is a there is a releasing system there so this releasing mechanism is absolutely important and and that they develop it so we did exactly the similar type of analysis to to do that um, airbag analysis in that case again with with that we have got a, we did experiments and then put this in process so that uh, in this case it was uh, airbag who was sponsoring this so they would know that how those knots and ties how they would be connected so that the enough amount of gaps a and b in this case loop opening and ligament opening they call it. i mean what should be the optimum level that they should be having for to register certain amount of impact and of course, the timing is important that when a person is going to hit the airbag. This was done about the same time, uh, slightly after when Nilanjan was doing his PhD. How am I doing at the time, Professor Paul? Slide, the time. Slide, please. No, no, it's fine. Please proceed. It's very interesting. Okay. Nice description. Okay. Please proceed. Okay. So, uh, is there any question at this point, or I'll take it at the end? So, you take the question at yeah, the end, we... right? Yeah, okay. we'll, we'll see the questions at the end, yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll then probably breeze through a few other uh, work that uh, have been recently involved. So one of those would be this customized insole using additive manufacturing. So food orthosis is, orthotics is, is quite a big business in, in various countries, and it could happen from diabetes, new osteoarthritis, plantar fasciitis. so with my colleague, uh, Paolo Bartolo, we had the student who was working on, uh, in, in, in UK, there is something called national health system. So if you go for an insole from any of these conditions, they comes in the shoe sizes, which are not enough. Uh, and then people don't use it after a few attempts and then they throw it away. So what we are proposing in those cases was to make some customized insole. So what we'll have, we'll take an imprint of those um, uh, patients a foot imprint and then use a pressure sensor 
using pressure pad and then use a customized insole design depending on the strength that is required in each part varying the polymer polymer strength into each part now whole point of carlos thesis is is to have a machine which is which can be used in a gp's um, um, surgery so and 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 there is a sort of cost limitation of 10000 pound or something and so that so the his project was to make this 3d bioplotter type of machine which can take the foot imprint and then uh, take the pressure and then use different ways of layout the polymer so that you can have that um, one. So his main focus is to develop the machine. Technology wise, it's nothing new that we are talking about here. It's it's how you can make a cost effective machine in this case manufacturing, which could make using the additive manufacturing. So we, we made various things in here and some of those were tested in a way. In now I'll take you to a little bit uh, on the third problem with the modeling process and this one. So it, often it is used when you don't know how to do that, when it, it modeling also helps you design the experiment. And that's what I'm going to show it into this example. Now, many uh, people with um, uh, brown and black skin color have got something of a keloid. Keloid is a type of cancer where if you have got a cut, then they don't heal up. Instead, you form those uh, those nodules or globules. And early uh, medi medics knew about this. And the guy called Langer, he developed those Langer lines uh, that's shown in this diagram. And that shows that, uh, and these are the typical Langer lines that surgeon would use. So if they want to operate on somebody's abdomen, they will cut across the abdomen, never vertically. Why? These Langer lines represent the line of tension in the skin. So the skin is the largest organ in the body, and, and then that has got a variable amount of skin, a variable amount of tension on different parts of the body. So one of the hypotheses on of the keloid scar researcher were that they do develop where there is a skin tension. So they do develop at the end of the year where there is a tension there. They develop in, in the body in the middle, which is a sternum. So, so the way you was to investigate is that you take some cells and then you put under tensions. And then you see where that the protein that is related with the keloid scar, in this case, it was called TGF beta, if you're not interested in biology, just ignore that, just a growth protein, whether that develops more under the tension or not. So we did number of studies. So we took, we took uh, volunteers and we measured using a 3D stereoscopic camera, how much tension is on the screen surface. So by, by, by in, in terms of not force, but tensile strain and then putting that onto the petri dish, putting that strength. So, so that this uh, project was involved into schematically in this way. So in vivo, so we took measurements of human body and using stereoscopic camera, we measured the sternal region, which is near the chest. We measured how much is the tensile strength. And then in vitro, we need to put in the in in some in, in in the biological gel agar gel we put those cells and then we need to apply the tension there and see and through the standard one gene expression cell morphology proliferation toxicity so these are the ways that you identify whether the tension is creating those growth protein or not and then of course the therapy and those things would develop now of course the, the biological people call computational as in silico stands from silicon so they have got in vivo in vitro and in silico that's the standard term they use and then what we what we did was one of the thing was you in the in vivo you have measured the tensile strain how do you translate that into the stresses or the tension onto those little cells and there are millions of cells and how do you generate a field where the tension stress would be uniform for example so we had um, uh, in the in the engineering lab 
we, we so we measured the tensile strain in the top left corner from the from the human body and then we put in the agar gel in here and putting with a with a sort of a micro cali uh, calibrations we are trying to put some tension by turning a screws but what should be the shape of those tension giving the plates for example so you'll have the uh, petri dish here and you have got two plates inserted onto the plate and they'll be pulled apart from each other and that will provide the tensions into the gel medium there which will affect the which will affect the tension onto the cells so what should be the dimension of them what rate they should be pulled uh, uh, apart from each other so we did a detailed computation and analysis of those cell morphology and came up with an optimized scheme so that it gives in the in the center a zone on which you will have a, a, a sort of a uniform tensile zone and then the cell samples would be collected from that zone and then used for subsequently studied for the development of this keloid fibroblast so again in this case it was used to design the experimental uh, uh, work in these scales now we'll say we are not actually we are we are we are designing that to create a zone of equal zone of um, uniform tension field in this case at at that level and forces we are talking about very small in terms of the micro uh, newton to millinewton uh, force limit in this case so whether the finite whether the finite element is appropriate or not that's a different question but that was applied nevertheless so then we, we, we published this onto uh, various one and they got, got into various uh, awards in there as well so this one i skipped uh, this one I'll, I'll probably just quickly say so this was the orthotic braces using mr fluid again uh, the idea was that if you if you break your wrist for example you go to uh, go to the hospital they put a plaster cast problem with plaster cast is when they're applied your arm or the wrist is probably swollen uh, it's big so that uh, so that the plaster cast often uh, when swelling goes down with medications then you have got looseness inside that plaster cast so the idea here was to have a fabric sort of like a piece of paper type of thing made up of made up of fibers which would be hollow and they will have magnetic um, mr fluid inside them and then um, uh, so they have got a rheological proper property so if you bring a magnet next to them they will they will put themselves into the channels and then they increase the stiffness and then you wrap it up and then when you want to take it off then you pro provide a reverse uh, magnet um, you, you put a put a magnet in the reverse way and then get rid of those channels and then can find out um, then then again retighten it so this was a concept study was done so these are the fluid field mr fluid field magnetorheological fluid mr fluid field tubes and then the stiffness of those was studied under a magnetic field and without a magnetic field in this case so that that could be used into those format in there so these are the some physical dimensions in here in the form of orthotic braces and these are the how the system was designed again modeling was a key part into it as you could see it from here the modeling was embedded into it as, as a process in terms of the designing the experiment what you'd be expecting from the results as well and then subsequent validations so so that you do the experiment with five fibers in this case now then you can scale up of course then the validation issues and would come in there but at least that will show the proof of concept whether having an experiment with this five set of ten set of fiber here whether you can scale it up or whether it is feasible to scale it up or the effect would be there or not modeling comes into a um, great advantage in this case so using this stereoscopic camera so leave that we do uh, i do work on uh, stresses in bones for example for various cases uh, this is about 10 years back this work so there is a, a condition called femoroacetabular impingement so what happens is some people have a bony growth at 
at some point in here and then that so it's the top of the ball and socket joint and then it, it, it impinges and it is quite painful. So what the surgeons do, like everywhere in the world, they have got some rule of thumb. So they say the rule of thumb in this case is don't go more than half the depth and don't scoop out more than one third of the cross-sectional area. Now the question is whether that is very much would be the patient specific. Can you go beyond half or would half of the depth would be detrimental for some patients possibly already? Uh, there could be a fragile um, uh, level of osteoporosis, for example. So what we did was develop a scheme uh, with, with patient-specific 3D and MRI and CT scan, and then the surgeon would be involved here. So they'll use a digital scalpel and scoop out the way they'll do the operation. And then you'll do the analysis of that particular patient in terms of the fracture mechanics point of view and give, give the, with an XFM analysis to give the fracture propensity in those cases. And then that could show. And that's being, being um, taken up into this hospital north of Manchester here, with, with this group um, uh, uh, in, in their called Wrightington Orthopedic Group. So they do work on these principles in here. So they, we worked with them in the other conditions as well, present with dyslexia and how these acetabulum positions changes in that way. So how much you cut and rotate. So this is my final one. I think I'll, I'll put it in. In the third category of the, of the modeling versus process, is in the microfluidics, so which I've been involved uh, uh, recently. And the subject that we studied uh, is published in this one are oscillating cilia. Now cilia are the little hair-like structures that lines our guts, part of the intestines, and also part of the blood vessels and the, uh, and the arteries and, and, and some of the veins as well, uh, mo mostly arteries. So what they do is they do of course, they help with the absorbent of the nutrients into, into, into the body, but they also do something clever. So cilia vibrate within the flow of the uh, fluid in there. And depending on the vibrations there, there will be local eddy that would be produced. And then a nutrient particle floating in the, in the blood, for example, would be able to either deposit it there or or would be moved on further. So the idea here was whether we can develop a model to understand that behavior and finally do some experiment using some of the microfluidics techniques. Now the experiments stopped because of various other reasons, because A, to get that aspect ratio, some of these, um, uh, some of these cilia to be made, and making it an array and do that, take the reading, etc. But we did employ a different techniques here called lattice Boltzmann emerged uh, module in the fluid dynamics, fluid filament, and then uh, we could solve those issues in here. So this would be excellent in terms of the drug delivery for, for a point of view. So if you have got a part of the uh, body where you want to deliver a certain drugs, then you can um, vibrate the cilia on those parts by injecting a drug beforehand. So that will vibrate at a certain frequency, for example, or certain ways, and then the wake that will form or vortices that will form that will drop the drug molecules at that stage. So that was the, and then we validated this one in a different way. Again, there is no experimental in this case, but we did the validation was, the modeling validation was done first of all with the analytical uh, problems with the regular structures here, and then used uh, used beyond it to take into account the other effect for different Reynolds number and and different pressures uh, inlet outlet pressures for example in here. So I think the uh, time is limited here. I had a few other things to talk about, but probably that's for some other time. So I I stop it here. I mean, uh, Dr. Moral, if you want, you can, uh, you know, the uh, explain all our two examples because because it's very interesting. So if you want, you can do that. It's not that very, hard, you know, hard and fast rule that it has to be completed by 9.30. We can next go beyond 9.30 as well. 
uh, shall we say if people have got a burning questions they're up to here and then they ask him now because people may have to leave and then uh, what i can do is i can go after that if, if people have got questions at this stage yeah as of now you know the there is not uh, much many questions only one generic question is that the how, what are the modeling and numerical analysis method used for prediction of evolution of microstructure in pixel sensor building so that that's uh, um, parvez is there he, yeah, he, that, that. he is going Another question is that if you take any modeling software, the APM, CFD, there is always this black box which you have talked about, where the various governing equations and matrices are solved. As someone who is interested in the process modeling, how important it is to learn about more about the black box and how can I go about learning about it? Yeah, that, that's a very um, valid point. Uh, my take on that is is you, you strive to know that process involved in there of course you do but ultimately you cannot help but choi uh, use this as a tool but if you use the tool effectively with all the checks and balances in place so you if you do the verifications very well if you do the sensitivity analysis well calibrations well and then you get a validated model with the experimental one then you can have some rely on the results that you get of course you don't know how that is giving you the results but often that's what you have to be satisfied with for example this whole branch of, of neural network based modeling and some of the other statistical based modeling you are taking it as a as as an input and the output you give the input you get the output you don't know what's going on in in inside so for a student i guess it is important but possibly sometimes he cannot get into the detail level that one would like and possibly not advisable because we have to produce the results it, it depends on the focus here yeah, uh, Dr. Mondor, one question has come up from one of our students. In fact, who is, you know, the jointly supervised by your student, Nilanjan. Mm -hmm. It's from Ranjan. Uh, what are the key points to keep in mind when modeling frictions are welding process, you know, for, for metal matrix compound? What are the key factors to be considered? So the key factors for any modeling means, I think these questions could be, answered by Professor Paul better than me because I'm not an expert on bricks and star welding. Uh, but if for any modeling, the key parameter, you, if you remember my first uh, second slide was that you need to see what you are modeling, what part of the process you are modeling and what is the focus of your modeling. And then whether you are choosing the appropriate equations to or then the our numerical technique to do that and then comes the second questions of the input so the input you will, you will have some control input and then of course you will vary certain input in that way so in the case of friction star welding what we have seen with Parfis work that the uh, tool shoulder diameter plays uh, a, a big role the speed definitely plays uh, rotational speed plays a, a, a big big role in 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 there as well but also the plunge depth how much you are putting into the depth so so these are the key parameters in that way into into the friction uh, star welding process now if your if your specimen is flat then of course these are probably the uh, one that you'll be uh, involved with but if it is a carved one then you have to think about the relative ratio of the diameter of the pipe in the parfait case that he is infusing or he is welding to the to 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 the solder uh, diameter in in this case. So how much? So for example, if you have got a big diameter pipe and if you have got a small solder diameter, then that is effectively as good as a flat in this case. But whereas if it is the other way around, if they are comparable in terms of the curvature, then you are not going to use enough solder 
diameter in this case. So even if you increase the solder diameter, some part would be not touching the pipe in that sense. So it all depends on the problem, but in terms of the simple fix and start welding, these are the three major one that they have, um, that I have, I have uh, come across by working with uh, Professor Paul's group in that way. Do you want to add anything else, Professor Paul? No, no it's fine, yeah. So uh, the one question has uh, Dr. Manor come from Tariq Anwar, is that uh, the for the biomedical application that you have shown, uh, how will the skin tissues and bones be modeled? Mm. How can so, the characteristics of our yeah. skin and bones be modeled? Yeah. So again, again, you develop a model in a way that what you are, what your hypothesis is. So, so in the case of that uh, keloid tissues in the in 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 inside a pool of gel, so the gel has got a microstructure of a porous structure. So they have got a pores inside them. So the first bit of analysis that we did was we assumed a continuum structure. So continuum without any voids or anything. And then we, we we said, okay, this is the this is the way to uh, this is the way. So that that result that piece of analysis gave us that how do you pull two plates apart so that it generates an uniform tensile tensile field. So that was sufficient for that piece of analysis. We didn't go into uh, in detail of of, of the generating those ports, etc. But when it comes to the how much force even within the tensile failed. So you can imagine you have got a hollow foam like structure and the cells would be within those. Now you can, you are, you are putting the tension onto the outer foam structures really, but how much that tension is actually transferred to the cells, that's the next level of calculations. So it, it, it is intrinsically, this whole modeling process is, is, is step by step process. And, and 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 you shouldn't attempt or one shouldn't attempt to do that uh, at the first instance a complicated model because it would be very difficult to then um, find out if there is any potential error or or if the results don't match very difficult to find so doing it step by step so first step uniform continuum model like a brick and you apply the tensile strength now how much of that tensile strength is going into the cell who is hiding maybe some of them are hiding within the pores so then that's the next bit of analysis that we have to undertake and again this sort of analysis maybe we need to come out from FE and in this case you can use something called a multi-physics software like for example console so the consoles you can easily generate the type of voids different types of voids which will be could be interlinked non-interlinked if you put into put into a probabilistic element there then it could be a non-regular structure as well and then you can put the cells in, in those locations and see how much they will be experiencing those strain inside there. So to answer your question, it's difficult, but it is done always in a multi-stage. You never attempt the uh, biological structure to model as they are, or you never think that you will be able to model them as they are. Because if you're talking, you spoke about bone, bone big thing would be the anisotropy. So homogeneity is of course one aspect that I was covering, but then the anisotropy, the, the uh, properties are different in different directions and it's very difficult to measure those. You can do it anisotropy measurement in a bulk way, but locally, what is the anisotropy is, is almost, if not impossible to measure in those cases. So you have to limit your focus of analysis and then do the app, develop the model. And at the same time, all the time be aware of the uncertainty that is involved with with the results that you are getting is that does that answer yeah okay so uh, uh, dr mandal let us have one more question uh, before we uh, yeah. okay so uh, the question is that uh, how can you approximate the coefficient of friction in multi layer fibers under compression so so that was done in in two ways i think what i was trying to give there nilanjan's remit to a slightly different so we we did the experiment and we had a value 
of 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 fiber frictions with with different grouping so you will have the toe versus toe frictions for example and of different amount of toes so so we had um, different um, experimental setup rig to do that and then also at at various lower level few fibers to few fibers so experimentally we could measure that but what was the remit was that how you can approach both ways of the when it comes to the friction what i mean by both ways that if you know the friction coefficient between two single fibers two single filaments how does it translate when they are in a group means what are the mechanism that goes into the friction process so his his remit was to understand the, the how frictions between the carbon fibers work so you get a friction uh, coefficient say let's say 0.1 for example now uh, between fiber and fiber does it stay 0.1 when you have got a 20000 fibers between them you try to uh, you try to squeeze them is it 0.1 no now of course you could measure that what is the bulk value how much do they spread but what is the process by which it changes when you change the values from uh, two fibers to, to 20000 fibers now again the modeling that was applied uh, the modeling was used here to understand that so you you know the end points in that way and and you know some of these in between points so you go from one to another by developing the point using the multi scale approach so what he will do is he will start with probably 19 fibers uh, start with as a 2d slice and then the interactions between them he will represent by some springs between them so they they looked in that video they are floating in the air they are not so they would have the invisible springs between them so the springs will have uh, fiber to fiber compressions behavior and also the slipping characteristics when they come in contact with each other then how much frictions they would have and that would be always you have to take into the uh, perpendicular directions to the normal so the frictions would have on and, and and opposite to the direction of movement for example and also that if you have got a bundle of fibers then the length effect also comes into the in, in picture as well so there may be a local kink so a couple of fibers may have may be pulled in the length directions so then they will have the out of plane uh, friction as well so all those things are put into those 19 fibers using those springs and once it has done that then he will get a compression force versus the the compressions characteristics and that would be then the behavior of the springs for the next level so the next level then each of these 19 fibers would be represented by a single element and then that will increase by say 19 times 19 or, or some other 19 times 37 in that case so that way then then you get the properties from the previous one and then of course you periodically check it with your experimental model so then that will that way you get a better understanding of how friction works at the dry fiber levels at different toe size yeah so dr mondo could you please uh, enlighten us about uh, some of your you know the other, other more other areas of uh, you know the modeling like okay uh, so I'll, I'll show you some examples then so yeah that would be great So not much i'll show you a few so this one was done using this was this was on something called abdominal aortic aneurysm so aneurysm is uh, so uh, so the okay so the heart pumps the blood around the body through the arteries as you know and the biggest of these arteries is called aorta which goes through the middle of the abdomen through and then bifurcates towards the two leg area and what happens is uh, in the abdomen for various reasons due to deposition fat deposition and or or, or the stiffening of the artery wall uh, they could develop into a sort of a balloon for example due to so they they expand and by expansion they could 
for example, rupture as well. So the typical diameter at this, um, uh, where it expands to, so maybe the standard, there are some standard uh, guidelines. They say if that extends to say 5.5 centimeter, which is 55 millimeter diameter that goes to, then you need to think about operating them, stiffen them up or do uh, other, 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 other measures. So the idea here was to do a numerical analysis of this abdominal aortic aneurysm and see whether that could be patient specific, for example. So whether the layer of depositions would have the role and if it does fracture, where do the actual fracture, whether we can process the, do the simulation so that that can help the surgeon before carrying out the uh, carrying out the unnecessary operation or in some cases maybe some of them would rupture even before it goes to 5.5 centimeter and once it ruptures you cannot do anything the patient will die within 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 an hour for example so there, there is nothing can be done once once they they rupture so the quite a bit of uh, modeling work was involved by this uh, student so we took ct so the first stage was First year, this, this student must have worked very hard and he has now gone back to Iraq. So uh, I have to, so first stage was that doing a CT scan gives better picture, true, but it is, it is ionizing radiations that it emits. So whether we can take ultrasound images, which will be not that good quality in terms of the resolution, but whether we can have an effective numerical model using ultrasound images. The advantage, you can do it more frequently. So that rather than CT with ionizing uh, radiation. So the student had shown, yes, CT is possible if you do certain processing with it. So that was the first bit of work. So with two sort of equipment or in terms of the process, that yes, US ultrasound is uh, less resolution, but it can be replaced for CT for generations of a numerical model, for example, for an effective FES simulation. So we do, uh, again, we do the validations of this work in various ways with the other people's work who have done similar work. So you take their model and then see whether your model is getting produced in that way. So this is, student has said this is a validation, but probably this is more like a verification in that way. That, okay, the way you are, you are modeling them is, 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 is ver verified in that sense. Validation should have to be, in, in, I'll, I'll come about the validations in a, in a moment. Now, one of the other things that we tackle then is many cases people uh, put in the literature they do a, a numerical model in this case, and they pick up the peak stress and say, okay, and measure the peak stress goes to a certain value. They say, okay, fine, uh, it is going to rupture. But imagine if that peak stress is due to discretization problem. Say, for example, you have got an element which have got rugged edge, and that will have the stress concentration, and that will have a high stress. Now, would you be saying that that is the level of stress or not. <clears throat> so what we emphasize on all our stress-based calculation, just never ever look at a maximum stress that you see your finite element results is doing, uh, giving you. It will normally give you, give you a contour plot and it will get a maximum stress. And don't ever take that value for any meaningful comparison, because that may be at a just a local point, and it 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 could be computational artifact, it could be realistic even, but at small stress at a very small point may not be enough to call rupture. So what we always do is to draw a frequency chart of the stress, and then see, then plot what is known as sort of a characteristic stress. So each of these, uh, so what we the way we do is. So we divide this into segments of the volumes, and then we find out the how many volumes, how much volume has got how much stress, and then we plot those frequency plots. And then we can we take an engineering approach in this case. We say take it as a 95% uh, characteristic strength. So you pick up the maximum stress, 
you come down at a 95 percent level looking at at those um, looking at those frequency uh, stress frequency plot and then you, you never take that the maximum location and you could see that the maximum stress of 0 0.6 occurs at a very very small area okay so that may not be enough uh, to do that so all the stress based calculations is done using this model and unfortunately more, many of the literature in this bio area don't do that they just pick up the highest rate. and you can see that these are the differences see for example if somebody does ct scan and somebody does ultrasonic scan ultrasound scan then the maximum stress in the ultrasound scan is 1.2 uh, megapascal in this case compared to the ct because ct has got much more better resolution and the same patient with ultrasound scan shows 1.2 then ultrasound 0.54. Now, if you just consider the maximum stress, you say ultrasound is useless because I am not getting enough resolution. CT is much better. So this is again your process questions of the modeling. And so ultrasound cannot be used for modeling. But hang on, you look at the mean stress of the whole one. They're not that bad. Then you check the characteristic strength, the stress that I, the way I was saying, and you could see they are very very close so you can use ultrasound uh, instead of ct which has got ionizing uh, radiation as long as you are asking you are trying to find out the right parameter so not uh, your uh, maximum stress here or here it is, it is the characteristic thing that you are you are referring to okay so we then uh, went into various ways uh, so then xfm approach we took to go into uh, go into the fracture and, and pro fracture propensity and predicted stresses and the validation here when I'm talking about the validation was done by the surgeons so what we did was we have got these pictures of this aneurysm and then we, we took five surgeons who operates on the patients and asked them to draw from their experience what they think that if this would rupture where they would rupture, for example. So they, they took on this piece of paper and then the pencil in, into that this is the cases where it is likely to rupture. And then we, 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 we of course, uh, take an overall collated view on those uh, rupture and then validated our model with those. So there are validation doesn't have to be based on experiment or you don't need uh, patients to uh, die and then you take the record and that's it. you could do it in the other ways as well or, or you don't put a higher pressure to bust it something with that with an animal model in this case so the, it could be done with the experience of this one so this is also way of validation so you you are you, you we are using the validation of their their expertise and then again we compare in various ways that where do they say to then where it is fractured etc then also we said okay most cases they do study using an isolated model. Now, isolated model is great, but uh, uh, it reduces the complexity to whether other organs would be having anything because the aneurysm aorta is next to the spinal cord and the other internal organs in, inside the abdomen, whether they would have any effect into this fracture, uh, rupture potential. So what we did was then started to put in the internal organs into, into the whole system and then started measuring these things. And you could see that the stress profile and other things with the sub when it is supported by organs, not supported by organs, and starts to be different. Naturally, they will be different. But then how much different, whether you need to do that, etc. That's different order of questions in that sense. But again, the modeling as I was just, uh, showing you, it develops stage by stage. So we don't start with the putting in all the organs and then do that. That would be not advisable for any of this problem. So you do it by step by step. You, 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 so you could see that with surrounding organs, you will have less stress than, than, than the without the surrounding organs. So, uh, and then also other things that people do is, 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 is check is the, is the FSI simulation because many cases they are not coupled, most cases analysis in the literature. So they have got this aneurysm model, they put the fluid pressure into it and then they 
see the stress calculation they do the stress calculation but what happens is due to the stress due to the pressure the aneurysm part expands as soon as it expands it affects the pressure for example and then with the every beat of the heart this should be expanding contracting so what you need is a complete coupled problem of a what is called fluid structure interaction so your your fluid will exert pressure your structure so normally cfd which is computational fluid dynamics the standard one assumes rigid boundary whereas the structure we assume the load is fixed and then the structures can deform biological case it's like in all real cases is in between and most prominently so so your load will depend the pressure inside the artery will depend on how much it has expanded and your structure experiencing that the iota experiencing the load experiencing it will depend on the pressure would be depending on how much at what stage of the expansion it is so fluid structure interaction is absolutely important for this sort of problem so that is what we did in the final bit of it and then so and again we didn't do it at the first we did it towards again with um, um, built on to uh, slowly in that case so the student has just finished so we have to publicize this uh, or rather um, these results now but i'm giving you a close up view on this case other problems no i think let us stop here because yeah. it's 9:50 okay. in our time thank you dr monral it's uh, really amazing i mean you have nicely explained the uh, fundamental need of uh, the modeling in various process and in a lighter note i would like to comment on that uh, you know the uh, we work on the uh, manufacturing systems manufacturing systems it's complicated we know that uh, but at the same time it's it's a bit structured and uh, you are working on you know the various the domain not only in the manufacturing uh, you know also in the bioengineering field and that too in the different you know the organs of the human body so how do you manage to do that i mean do you have a very strong group or the collaboration with the various doctors in the uk in the various hospitals and all because uh you know the uh, understanding the different organs and then and modeling it it's a, it's a, it's a, i mean uh, really difficult job so yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, co collaboration is the key when it comes to the biological or bioengineering so for each of these problems i have got a medical collaborator so they know my knowledge of biology and human biology is very rudimentary so i know what i need to know sort of things so what i need to know to uh, do the project and that, that sort of thing but having a knowledge of the complex system in that sense of the biological side i always rely on a good collaborator so all the projects that i have done so far in the biological side has got a medical partner involved all the bones one all the hemodynamics one and also i collaborate with other colleagues for example my specialization is in sort of solid mechanics area but each of these hemodynamics problem i'll have my colleague who is expert is whose expertise is in the cfd side for example so uh, so the computational fluid dynamics side and then we devise the experiments together measure the things and then um, it's a it's a collaboration is the key in these cases so nothing is uh, what i can say nobody can say the doctor wouldn't know the medic medic wouldn't know the complexity of the whole system in that sense so it is something new for them we don't know much about the human biology of that as an engineers but we know how engineering system work so the whole point is to apply the knowledge of from our perspective how an engineering system work and how we model and understand the engineering system or analyze the engineering system apply that to the human biology context of course the problem is they are much more complicated than engineering system after all an after an aluminum tube is made in a factory and you can you can you can test 10000 of the specimen you cannot do that with the human body and and they are inherently complex system so it it's just like denting into into the big piece of rock and chip away the knowledge as much as you can get
Yeah, that's why I was wondering that uh, the working on the different fields of uh, the body, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. organs is really. Do you find any similarity, like when do you model the skin and when do you model the the bones and all? So, do you find any similarity or the the commonality in the modeling aspect? Yes, it's exactly the same model that same techniques that we apply. Now, uh, often they don't apply to the when you change the scale, they don't. Then you do something. Then if 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 he is not working, you go to console or do some multiphysics problem or uh, modeling or you do in this in that case uh, the the cilia, uh, microfluidics the fluid okay, yeah, yeah. cilia flow that required a heavily dynamic problem to be analyzed with the fluid in motion and also some amount of fluid structure interaction if here was not possible abacus fluid structure interaction not possible so we went into then something a, a person does something called lattice boltzmann which is very quick and it can do the rapid real time simulation and it of course discards many things with the traditional cfd would account for but we didn't need that we just needed how a vibration of cilia would influence the fluid flow surrounding those now again that we went to the guy who is expert in this lattice boltzmann uh, analysis in that way and used that code to do this work so so there is there is not a so i personally my philosophy is i take modeling as a tool to solve a problem so so i am not indebted to any of the modeling methods so i and i don't claim any expertise on any such so i wouldn't say i am expert in fe i'm expert in that I'm, i use them as a tool as you do it for any other thing my main focus is to solve a problem you have got a problem and let's see how we can solve it using using various techniques i mean I, are these projects sponsored by the yeah. epsrc mostly so mostly mostly either sponsored or if it is a phd student then either they get their funding and then uh we, we do get some funding from here and there to do some experiment and things yeah Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Monda. We could let, uh, I mean, let us stop here because it is close to ten o'clock. Thank you so much for your nice uh, and excellent uh, presentation. And the, you can see also in the chat box that uh, Professor Subir Mojinder has mentioned that excellent presentation style by Dr. Mondal. I really appreciate that. The way you have explained the need of modeling and correlating with the various, uh, you know, the applications is really amazing, beautiful. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for uh, listening. As I said, it's 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 all it's like that story of uh, writing the essays on cows on the burning pyre. But probably you are not illuminated by the manufacturing process. But I hope you got some glimpse of other modeling scenarios and context. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank Once again, I request Anand. Thank you, everybody. I request Ananta to let us know about the speakers for the upcoming uh, the weeks. Only three more weeks to go. The next week will be by Professor Sujit Banerjee of uh, University of Warwick, Warwick Manufacturing Group. Professor Banerjee will be talking on the evolution of cloud computing and its importance in the field of manufacturing. All our videos, uh, I mean, the webinars are recorded. So if, uh, anyone can, uh, you know, the want to watch, you can watch it by scanning this code. With this, I would like to conclude today's session. Thank you so much. I look forward to your presence next Saturday. Thank you.